Uh, this week, we're joined by Nick Groves, familiar face, uh, angler up on the ground for many years, and streamer aficionado, uh, Renzetti pro tire as well. So really lucky to have somebody of his caliber with us. Um, Nick fishes a bunch of the Southern Ontario stuff around here, and we're going to be tying some certain Michigan-influenced steelhead bait fish, uh, which will be mm -hmm. interesting tonight. So Nick, how's it going? Good, good. Hope everyone's doing great tonight. The birds yeah. are chirping. It looks like spring is maybe finally coming. I guess things are turning. The, Rivers are swollen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I could, I can tell it's spring when my dogs come in from a run and I have to hose them down before they come in the house. So <laughs> find it good. That's worth it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sweet. So tell us what we're gonna be doing, or tell us a little bit about yourself. I guess for anyone who may not be familiar, where, where are you from? What do you do? How long have you been at it? Okay, well, um, Fergus born and raised. I've been fishing the Grand. Um, started by fly fishing and collecting bugs. I think I've mentioned that a bunch of times, but um, I'm still here. I'm in Alora now, so I've moved five minutes downstream. <laughs> um, but yeah, I started, started fly fishing when I was about 13, 14 years old, kind of self-taught. Um, spent my time kind of splitting between skateboarding, snowboarding, and, and fly fishing. And the Grand at the time was just starting to sort of take off and become very well known as brown trout fishery. So that kind of became my thing. Um, and yeah, like I was in University of Guelph uh, for about five years there, took a lot of time off fly fishing. And for the last probably 10 now, I've been really back into it. So I've been pretty fortunate to um, fish a lot of different water all over the US and Canada and um, learn from a bunch of people and, you know, really get into you know, both tying and, and um, fishing as much as I possibly can. Um, fun to learn all of the awesome species we have in Southern Ontario. It's funny, every time I come back from a species specific trip, it's always like you're landing back in Ontario and you think, oh, it was great. But then all of a sudden you've got like eight different fish you can, you can target year round in the province. So um, I'm happy here, uh, love the Grand. Uh, board member of Friends of the Grand uh, River for a few years now and um, lots of good stuff happening there to, to try and document some science behind some of the changes that we've seen over the last 25 years and that's pretty exciting times for us. Um, but yeah, recently like streamer fishing is a big thing for me from trout up through muskie, uh, even steelhead sometimes of the year um, and you know swinging flies is uh, graduating from the nymphing game on the smaller trips to getting in a boat and fishing some of the larger river systems, um, you know, right up until it's, it's ice out or ice in, um, has become almost as much of a, you know, thing for me. I really love um, kind of the science and figuring out and dialing in steelhead. Uh, they're an elusive fish, um, especially on the swing. It's, it's an interesting game for sure. So it's just one more thing to kind of add to the, the arsenal we have here. Um, with that comes just a complete abyss of information, uh, flies, patterns, techniques, gear. And, you know, if you, you kind of go around the block on it and you go full circle and you come back to kind of what was I doing five years ago? And it was back when I didn't know a lot of stuff and I was actually catching fish because I was relying on confidence. Um, so yeah, anyways, like a lot of, a lot of the, when I'm talking and teaching and tying most of my, a lot of my philosophy is in having confidence in what you're doing. Um, I find you put a fly on that you don't like, uh, you're not going to fish it well. And I think that has a lot of impact on the way I fish. So, you know, patterns, uh, for, for steelhead, especially on the swing, depending on the conditions can be very kind of sensitive. Uh, but you got to really want to do what you're doing um, and kind of feel it out. So I guess, you know, I, I think a lot of people with steelheading and swinging flies, you can go through a lot of sort of seasons where you're kind of in the gear spin and you're wondering what is going on. Like, where are these fish? They were here last year and I caught them and now I'm not. And I think that it's just, there's so many different factors, just like everything. Um, but I've kind of regained some confidence um, past couple seasons. I've been, I've been, you know, focusing and looking a lot to across the, across the pond over in Michigan and watching what a lot of the guides that have been doing it forever are doing. And, and one of the people that really stands out for me in the last couple of years, that has got a lot of confidence uh, for swinging flies back with me is uh, Kevin uh, Feenstrup. He's been a longtime guide in Michigan. 
Um, his flies are very, very unique, but he's got so much science behind what he does. He spent a lot of time um, doing a lot of underwater photography, you know, knowing where the, where the bait is, you know, when fish are going to be moving through and eating it, and, you know, how to fish different things at different times. Um, you could talk forever. Kevin could probably talk forever. Um, I've never met him, but I've read his most recent book, which I, I'm a huge proponent of. I think you have it in the shop, Chris, if I'm not mistaken, Matching Bait Fish. Um, incredible book. The, the photography alone will get you very creative as to kind of realizing some of the different looks that different bait fish that are conducive to both Michigan and Ontario have. And you'd be really surprised after looking through the book, just at some of the crazy colors and stripes and patterns there are on all the different bait fish that we both share on, on both sides of the lake. Um, so, you know, the book is incredible. Uh, the patterns he ties are guide flies. I mean, they're, they're fished every single day and, and they're not difficult flies. Imitating Kevin's crudeness in, in his tying is almost impossible. Uh, I think a lot of people will comment on that, but I think it's the crudeness and the simplicity of his stuff that really is effective because he's focusing really on profile and color um, and where in the water to fish different types of things. So um, we'll try and try and go through three flies tonight. So we'll go through two of Kevin's flies, one of which is called the code breaker. Um, Last couple seasons, it's kind of opened my eyes quite a bit to sort of focusing in on on bait fish. Um, you can see this is I'm not sure if you can really see this too clearly, but it's the you know it's got a lot of white, uh, it's got a lot of contrast, it's got a lot of flash. Michigan flies, whether it's a it's a seven inch streamer or a, or a smaller swung fly. Generally, you're going to see a lot of just out there colors and flash, but you know when when Kevin applies this stuff, um, it really rings true to the colors and the profiles of a natural bait fish. As out there as they look, when you see them in the water, they actually they're all about performance. And um, so this fly in particular, the Code Breaker, um, is probably been one of my go-tos to bring my confidence back. You, it's endless with the color combinations you can you can throw into this thing. You know, the, uh, the materials are very simple um, and you'll find the more you fish this and the more it becomes effective for you, you'll kind of hone in on different, different sort of sizes and colors that, that work for you. Obviously with a two-handed rod, there's so many different setups you could have um, and it just depends on what the fish want, right? Um, so I would say in the last couple of years, that's probably my go-to, uh, few different color variations, keeping it simple, you know, honing in on what works for me. And so I wanted to tie that tonight for sure. Um, another one that's really interesting coming up in spring steelhead fishing, you know, depending on the season, you can get quite a bit of steelhead season out of the spring. Sometimes it can be more productive than even the fall in ways because the, the new fish coming in and the fish that are leaving are, are hungry and predatory. Um, one fly that's always intrigued me that he does is called the inside bender. Um, really, really simple. You know, you could you could crank these out as just about as fast as you could crank out a few yarn yarnies. Um, really interesting though the colors. He's got some really loud blues, rainbow colors, and uh, the way he's just setting the feathers in um, creates almost like you could take this thing for a lot of different things, but the colors that I'm going to show you tonight really imitate sort of a goby. It imitates shiner, depending how you, how you tie it. It could even be a, a small sculpin, uh, which generally the, those types of things in the river are generally smaller at the first of the year or in the spring. Um, really, really fun fly. He talks a lot about, you know, where and why he fishes this. I would suggest like for me, I've, been successful with it in multiple different situations. You don't just have to fish that inside bend with that fly. Um, if you, especially if you're on the shore and you see some things like that, then I would definitely be looking to throw it. Um, so the inside bender is really fun. It's probably the most unique profile and style of swung fly I've ever, ever tied. Um, and in the spirit of spring, if we got some time, um, this is just one of mine. Um, this is sort of what I would consider a fry or a juvenile fry imitation. I actually have a, uh, a soft egg in there to imitate the egg sac. Uh, it gives it a lot of bump in the front. 
Um, again, you're going to see lots of white, similar flash, um, you know, very sparse um, type fly. It's been really good for me in the fall, uh, regardless of the egg. Um, and I think it's again just those hues and the subtle white colors that that Kevin really promotes on a lot of his his guide flies, especially for bait fish. Yeah, I think some of this calls back to the fact that you know everyone always has the argument about whether or not what we have are steelhead. We'll leave that aside for tonight. But the reality is that our fish eat different things than they do out west too, right? So we do have a different fishery, whether or not you want to call fish different things. We're not fish and squid flies and stuff for these these fish right yeah yeah exactly generally not and i mean kevin it, the more you learn and read his books a lot of these flies he's adapting to brown trout too uh whether it's swung or stripped he he's taking again being a guy to have to tie his own stuff you know he's going from a shanked you know stinger swung fly with the same platform same profile stepping it up to a four inch fly on a, on a single hook uh that he's stripping and to convert a swung fly into a stripping fly and still get that movement you're looking for is pretty incredible. And um, so a lot, of, a lot of the stuff is, is translated right over into streamer fishing. Um, you know, Michigan, similar to our, our rivers, you can have brown trout, resident lake run fish. You can have like at any given time, you can have a lot of different species. Um, so, and again, that's another thing I really appreciate is the simplicity and the ability to convert something from one type of fished fly to another, imitating the same thing, but being fished a completely different way. So it's, it's kind of neat. The more you learn um, about that kind of style and thought behind flies, the more I think, um, at least for me, generates a lot of sort of creativity at the vice and, and thinking a lot more about what you're doing when you're in the river. And I think that that'll catch you more fish for sure. So um, does anyone have any questions about any of that? Cause I think from there, I'm gonna try and get through these three flies, um, talk as I go, ask questions, you know, as they come up. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, yeah, no questions as it is. As a reminder, if anyone wants to ask questions throughout, go for it, just use the chat function please leave yourself on mute and uh, yeah, we'll get those questions going as we receive them. Okay, perfect. And yeah, if anyone has any questions about materials, anything like that, just let me know. Um, so we're three different flies on three different shanks. Most of the steelhead flies that I'm tying are on a uh, straight shank. Um, so something like aqua flies, uh, you know, they have either a, a single eye or a fold over, um, big fan of these. They're super easy to use, very well made, no burrs ever really good. Um, and another, you know, another shank you could be using is like an OPST. Um, you get sort of 25 of them. So it's the same as a pack of hooks. You're not getting eight shanks or whatever. And I find you have a vice that'll hold a shank. Um, it, is a lot more easy to tie than if you're working on like a sort of a, a senyo shank or whatever, a fish or like a, a fish skull type um, shank with the, the fold over at the back. I don't find it's needed. You could easily do it. I just find it's a little bulk, bulky and awkward to make sure that stinger hook's gonna ride hook point back. As far as hooks, um, most of my swung flies are on a size four stinger. Um, Maybe I'll step up to a two, but you know something, anything that you're comfortable with, and and have caught fish and aren't getting hooks break and all that kind of stuff. So again, an aqua flies in a the the aqua talon in a size four. I'm running those on basically everything, um, different conditions and different confidence levels. I mean, there's a hundred hooks out there. That's just kind of what I what I've settled on. Big thing with Kevin and big thing I've come back full circle to is um, going from wire on a swung fly to hold the hook uh, to back to braid. Um, I don't find a lot of fouling with braid. Um, I actually have tried everything and I find the easiest, the fastest and the most consistent is running braid. It's easy to manipulate. You can very quickly get that hook set. Uh, it binds really well on the shank. This is a straight Power Pro. I'm using a 65 pound uh, Power Pro braid um, just to give it a bit more stoutness and a bit more rigidity. Um, it will wear and get floppy, but with a size four hook, I find uh, 65 pound is great. Um, you know, 
100 yards of it's going to last you quite a long time, go through quite a few flies. You can interchange these hooks, you know, depending on who you are and how many flies you tie. Um, the loop that you do, you can, you know, swap a hook out if you really had to. You can various different ways of doing it. Generally, if I'm if a hook's done, I'm usually retiring the fly. But this technique with the braid, it's fairly simple to change the hook out if you if you have to do that. Um, so the first one, the inside bender, uh, I'm going to be using a 27 mil shank. So I'm going to get that in the vise and start going. So depending on your vise, you're going to want to just make sure you get a few mils in there. So number one, you don't break the tip of the jaw. And number two, you get a good bite. Um, nothing worse than this thing popping out on you right at the end. It's very difficult to get it back in. Um, so that would be my only concern there. Uh, thread doesn't matter. I'm using red on this one just to stay kind of true to the, the pattern. Um, so I'm just going to tie this in and wrap right back to the, the jaw. These jaws actually are the Renzetti uh, game changer jaw. And I find that there's just so much clearance there for shanks, as long as you're not right on that tip, which I've broken the jaw doing, set it down a little bit, set it back a little bit. And it's, it's pretty awesome right up to like a 53 mil shank. So I'm pretty happy with that setup, but, um, there's many different tools out there. There's chuck tools and everything to hold shanks. So whatever, whatever works for you. Um, I'm going to take a very small bead chain. I'm going to take uh, four of them. I'm going to cut those off. And uh, that's just going to create or allow me to start to set a bit of a bulkier head profile, more of a flat sculpin uh, head or goby or whatever, rather than a smaller bait fish. Um, this shank is nice. It sets it up real, real nice uh, at the front because of the fold over eye. But with B chain, you can secure that pretty good no matter what kind of shank you're using. So I tie that in on the top with a few loose wraps, just figure eight back and forth, and then I flip it over. And just because of the balance and the swing, I'm just going to make sure, look dead on at it, just make sure that it's, uh, you know, balanced and centered. And then I'm going to start tightening down with a few few more figure eights, and then I'm going to come underneath it and pull tight. And what that's going to do is cinch the thread wraps, the cross wraps through, and really bite that down. B chain's a lot easier to set than um, lead eyes, so that's pretty good. I'm not worried about that going anywhere. You could hit it with glue, no problem. And then I've just taken uh, that number four hook on that 65 pound braid. I'll usually, if, a, if I'm tying a few, I'll usually just pre-loop uh, six of them. Some people leave the loop and tie or put the hook on after. Um, I find this is enough out of the way and I don't feel like doing that after anyway, because it's a pain. Um, wherever you want that stinger to go, I wouldn't go too far back on the braid. Um, you don't want it to go, you kind of want to bury this hook sort of right in the back of the materials. In general, I'm not running that stinger hook beyond my materials. I'm usually just putting it right at the back. So I've got my thread about midway. I'm just gonna make sure that the it's not uh, crossed over the braid. I'm gonna set it right on top and I'm gonna lash it in with the braid side by side on the top of the shank. One turn, two turns, and then take a look at it. Is that the profile you want? Is that what you're happy with? Thinking about the feathers and the material you're gonna apply, you know, here's your opportunity to move it. I generally, when I'm tying three or four of these, I know just based on where different parts of the vise are, I, I'm like, that's good. So here's your chance to, to lengthen it out a bit or shorten it up as you want. And then I'll start to, I'll hold the hook and lash that down back to the back. And you can see that's like super, just dead in line. I don't know if you can see that, Chris. Um, that's how simple it is with braid. Love it, really bites in. I'll come back up and I'll just take either tag end and I'll take the one away from me, tie it to the side. I'll bring the one closest to me and tie it to the other side. And then I'll wrap back. Trim that braid off. Um, if you want to glue it, go for it. I've never really had an issue with the stuff pulling out. Um, 
Kevin actually will do an overhand knot in the braid and he'll put it right through the eye of the hook and tie it back and just leave it hanging out. Back. <laughs> he doesn't care. I just, I cringe at that kind of thing. I got to be a little prettier than that. Um, but generally like I, I've never had a pull out on doing it this way. And I, I'm, I'm going up and down sort of kind of crisscross and back and forth just to make sure it's secure. Um, and then I'm just going to lay a nice thread base down. There's no actual dub body or anything on the shank. So I'm actually going to come right up to about midway on that shank. And there's nothing in behind. That's just straight up thread. Again, if you wanted to get fat fancy and put some braid or some mylar, some tinsel back there, go for it. But I don't think it matters. Um, and then the one kind of unique material on this is uh, like a jumbo hen saddle. They are available. They're not the easiest things to find, um, but if you do get one, even a natural grizzly or a tan, um, in this case, I'm gonna tone this thing with white on the, on the bottom and, and start to go with a bard on top. Um, if I was gonna substitute this thing, I would probably look at taking like a, a barge schlep and feather, a uh, nice fat one, and you could, you could sort of get the same effect. These are really limp, uh, limber feathers. So uh, a schlep and feather would probably be the closest thing that you'd maybe be able to pull it off. So I'm gonna take, um, you know, right from the middle of the uh, saddle here, I'm gonna take a couple of the barred ones out and just pick a few that have a decent taper on them, not too big because this fly is, is only about two and a half or three inches long. I'm gonna grab a couple of those. I'm gonna grab a white one for the sort of the, uh, what would be considered the underbelly. And I'm just gonna prep these. So I don't wanna take all this, all this junk, all this marabou at the bottom. I'm actually gonna use that stuff. So I'm not gonna trim or prep these feathers at all. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, and you can see the curve. I want the curve to ride down on this. Every feather is gonna have sort of a natural curve. So I'm gonna line, the bard on the top and the white on the belly. I'm gonna line the tips up. I'm just gonna peel it. I'm just gonna hold it back a little bit at the start of the marabou. And I'm gonna just tie that in and I'm gonna sort of hold it on top and give it a couple loose wraps. And what it, all my goal is here is to secure those, those feathers on the top of the shank. So two, a couple loose wraps and a couple tighter ones and that's good. Okay, so you can see that's that's laying on top. Uh, that white one is spun, so we're gonna redo that. Again, just to make sure they're kind of sitting on top of each other. And that's that's much better. So the stinger is underneath just at the tip of those feathers. And they're lashed in. So then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take this, these butt sections of the, where the, the marabou plumes are, and I'm going to start to build a little bit more profile. Otherwise, this thing would shrink down to nothing on the swing. So you do want to actually make use of the whole feather. So I'm going to double down on that. Again, I'm going to stack them. I'm going to take the short junk off, and I'm going to be left with almost like a wing piece. And Again, I'm just going to go right back on top and I'm going to lash that in right on top. And what that's going to do is start to bulk up the fly a little bit. So now that I have that tied in, um, I'm going to take a just a simple, straight up natural grizzly marabou feather, maybe two of them. And I'm going to sandwich that between that and one more of these feathers. And what that's going to do is just really start to create that forward uh, bulk and profile. So I'll grab a couple of these. And these, these feathers are, are just basically off of, you know, some remnants from a, from a chicken. It's more of a chicken marabou than a turkey marabou. And I'm just going to line up two of those feathers. And I'm gonna stack some of that on top and I'm just gonna keep stacking a little bit forward as I go, just making sure that I'm on the top of the shank with that or they're not setting down, just lay a little bit more of a thread base. Okay, 
Okay. Trim those off. And then I will take this next feather and sandwich all of that together. I, I usually will run this feather just a little bit shorter than the, the bottom two. And again, I'll lay that in on top. And then as you build up, um, you'll probably find like if you, if you think, you know what, that's pretty good, but I think I just wanna, this is where you have some room to, to kind of do whatever you want. So I'm gonna actually take one of the shorter, shorter, smaller, plumier feathers, and I'm just gonna make sure I've got enough in there because as these flies get swung, they're really gonna start to shrink down, especially with this uh, more delicate marabou. So I'm gonna put another tuft in there to start to flare it. And then I'm gonna add some flash. Um, there's no Michigan fly, I don't think, out there without flash on it. In this case, just to try and really imitate the colors that, uh, that Kevin's going for in this pattern. I don't think I've seen, seen it in too many different color variations. I'm gonna be using, he's a, he uses a lot of cranberry flashaboo. Um, I'm gonna use some Crelex, some red Crelex. I find that it's got a really modeled look. Love Crelex, it's a little more crinkly and it moves pretty good in the water. And some rainbow, straight up old school rainbow crystal flash. So I'm gonna start with the crystal flash. Um, kind of more, more is better. I'm gonna take about eight strands. If you need to cut some off, if you don't like the look of it, you can always take some flash off on the river if it's just too stand out for you. And I'm just gonna take this and I'm gonna line it up so that the tips, I don't want the tips like super even, I, I will stagger them a little bit and we can trim that up after. I'm gonna lay that in on top, tie that in with a couple wraps and then pull it back. And then if I wanna trim that now, I can just basically take it and randomly trim it so you've got a bit of a taper. Cinch that up. And then I will now add some red Crelex. Again, really great stuff. It's a real good substitute for that cranberry flash boo, which is, seems to be really hard to find up here. Hint, Chris, you might wanna grab some. Um, and again, you might wanna take a little less. This red's really stand out. So, you know, uh, I'll take about eight, eight strands of of the Crelex. And again, you could sub this in for like a fuchsia or, you know, whatever, whatever flash of boo or crinkle flash material you have will work on this, but it, it should be a red. That red really does stand out and it does suggest a natural um, bait fish pattern. So I've basically just layered in the red and the rainbow over top. So you can see we've got a lot of contrast going on. We got a lot of barring. We're starting to get a pretty good profile. That's basically it. Um, another big thing to build this head, the head's super simple. Most of Kevin's flies just have clumps of ice dub as head. Literally just hold it over the hook, wrap it on and you're done. Uh, but it does, it does create kind of the technique creates a really nice big bulky profile, gives the head that sort of nice flash and, and very unique colors he uses, but we're thinking more, you know, in a natural head. Um, a lot of the, the, the gray dun colors are really nice because they completely transform the water. This dark olive is a really neat one too, um, that does have a lot of different UV characteristics. So, you know, it's, it is specific but you can really play with it. Uh, any of the grays, lavenders, cinnamons, dark olives, all that kind of stuff works. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just tone this with two different, two different clumps. So I'm gonna take the dark olive and I'm currently behind the eyes. I'm gonna take a bunch of this, okay? And just to prep it, I'm gonna maybe pull it, shorten it up a little bit. I don't want it to be too long. And then I'm gonna keep it really loose, okay? All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put that right over, centered over the eye of the hook. 
I'm gonna grab it, I'm gonna give it two turns, and I'm gonna go in front. Okay, so that's that's it. Um, nice and loose, but it is secured. It's just like if you're stacking some laser dub for a streamer head, you know, those couple turns is gonna secure it, and you can do it a number of different ways to build more of a round bulk, or you could stack it top bottom. In this case, just on and go. Now I'm in front of the eyes, so this is just going to create a bit more of a veil and a taper. I'm going to do the same thing with the uh, the uh, UV gray. So I'm just going to take it. I'm going to pull it a little bit just to shorten it up, keeping it really loose. And I'm literally going to shove that over the front, give it a couple turns, and pull it back. And that's just created a pretty decent sort of two-toned head and that multiple UV in there, it will pick out, it will, it will shrink down a bit, but that's not a bad thing. Um, and again, it's not done yet. You don't need to be done there. If you wanted to throw some just to try and get a little bit more on the bottom, you could literally just stack another small clump on until you're happy. And then that's basically the fly. So it does have quite a bit of taper, quite a bit of profile. You can see that red thread underneath, but I don't think that's really any big deal. And it's just once it starts to swim in the water, it'll start to get a really natural um, taper. So kind of a unique one. Uh, really like fishing it. It's really fun to fun to see it actually swim because it does do a lot of stuff in the water. And uh, just to finish it off, I'll usually hit it with some glue. Just at the head and then I'll give it a quick whip finish and you're done. And I would probably suggest that even this as a Grand River pattern, if you're sort of swinging or just kind of dead drifting a streamer, um, you could step this up maybe a bit, or you could fish this fly on a single shank hook, like I would say all day long and be good. So that's it. That's the inside bender. I love it. That's so Feenstra. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> very, very much so. Um, you just know his flies as soon as you see them. They're fantastic. I know it's hard to it's hard to not know what whose flies they are. Um, but everything's got a purpose, man. Like watching watching them tie and just like as crude as it is, everything has a purpose and, okay. and very effective. So good pattern there. Totally play around with that. I mean, you could go you could go with an all white with just some gray hues in the front. You could you know there's a lot of different things you could do to play around with it but generally that pattern is the the actual real life imitation or the real life bait fish is going to have a lot of contrast a lot of barring a lot of a lot of greens a lot of reds a lot of olives and blues so so you um, mentioned there's um and there is in that book a ton of great photography on a lot of bait fish that we have are there specific color patterns he thinks of with regards to different bait fish or is he just kind of blending them together for the most part? Um, no, I think, um, you know, memorizing the book, he's definitely has um, colors and patterns that are imitating specific things. Gobies, chub, emerald shiners, um, dace, um, you know, uh, sculpin, all of that stuff. There are different sort of patterns for, um, with not a lot of variation in the way they're tied, uh, but they are they are different, and I think there's such a strong focus with him on the different different UV ice dubs, the different sort of colors that really match the profile and the look in the water of, of a natural. I mean, um, you see some of the I'm not sure if you can even see that, but there's just so many different natural bait fish out there um, that are just so highly varied that it just makes you think, okay, well, maybe this crazy stuff isn't, isn't too out there because these things are kind of nuts. And, you know, he talks a lot about different pieces of the river. If you're down at the bottom end and he's down in the weeds and sticks, you know, swinging sweepers and stuff in the bottom end, it's a whole different ball game uh, of how he fishes, the types of fish he knows are down there because he's spent time on the bottom of the river watching them. Uh, through midsections and then the upper reaches, um, you know, different structures, different depths. Um, there's kind of a science behind what to expect there as a naturally occurring uh, bait. 
Um, I can't pretend to be an expert. I mean, we're covering three, three flies that have worked pretty great for me in some of the runs that I consistently fish. Um, but, you know, there's so many similarities, I would say, between Michigan and, and our Ontario tributaries that, you know, again, tons of science. But at the end of the day, if you feel like it's going to catch a fish, you're going to have a lot more chance of catching one. <laughs> yeah, so, for sure. And um, really, these plaza are all, like I say, pretty darn buggy. So they, they probably cover a few bases at once. Mm -hmm. Definitely, um, for sure. Like uh, there, there is a video out there where he's tying the same fly uh, from like a three inch swung fly up to a seven and a half, eight inch pike fly. Right. Same stuff, same material, same basic platform. Just he can scale that thing up, which is incredible. Like mm -hmm. that isn't done very often. <laughs> oh, so, definitely not. And uh, so when you talk about, um, you know, tailing some of these flies for stripping as well. Um, like, are you, so you're, you're running a single hook at that point, which makes sense. You get a lot more weight, a little more action. Are you mm -hmm. tweaking anything else with these? Do you add dumbbells or cones or anything like that? Or do you change material and heads? Yep. Um, yeah, easily can swap B chain for adding lead or lead eyes. Um, some of like my biggest variation, the Saugeen is one of the main rivers that I'm fishing. And the runs that I'm swinging are generally, you know, three, three feet to six feet deep. Um, with the setups that I'm fishing with, I can generally get to where I want to be. Um, depending on the time of season, you're going to get to fish to move up in the column or you're going to have to get down. But generally at that kind of depth and flow, I find that B chain and then adding lead, um, either just straight strips on the bottom is, is sometimes enough to get that extra dig to get you down a few more inches. Never really want to be dredging the bottom um, for most, you know, in most cases, unless you're in some deeper pools in, in the winter. But certainly these these patterns are, are will be fished with lead eyes um and you know kevin fishing you know the pair marquette the muskegon i'm sure there's a lot of really deeper holes where he's he's swinging flies through 10 to 12 feet of water and in that case you know and different techniques if he's trying to drop that fly down behind some structure um easily and interchangeable so um you'll it's funny the movement on some of these things isn't substantial like it's not your classic idea behind a swung fly that's just meant to be plumy and breathe and pulsate in the water and all that stuff sometimes watching these things come in it's like what is this fly doing it just looks like a stick sometimes um, some of them do though have this interesting twitching movement and i think it has a lot to do with the crudeness of the way he ties them. he likes when he's tying his his bodies of these things just to be lumpy you know, and, and that subtle stuff on a swung fly is going to give you, you know, the subtle difference in movements. Um, but yeah, certainly um, not the general concept behind a, a swung fly. There is marabou, but there's a lot of craft fur. Um, lots of craft fur, lots of synthetics, you know, the most natural material for the most part on a lot, a lot of Kevin's patterns is mallard flank. Um, I don't know too many, and, and some rabbit, you know, rabbit, some feathers. Um, but I, you, you will notice it's a completely kind of different swim and a completely different kind of movement. And that code breaker, I've had some, well, the most aggressive takes I've ever had swinging flies is on these things. When the fish want them, they want them. Um, cool. Well, since so you mentioned it. Yeah. Uh, it. Okay. Um, so we'll do the next one. We'll do the code breaker. Um, that one is again, another one of Kevin's, my favorite, um, tying that on a giant, uh, 51 mil shank. Uh, so it is big. Uh, you can, you can scale these up or down. Um, I would say anywhere from like a 45 up, uh, the platform is, is substantial. Um, I've got some down into the, like the sort of the two and a half inch, um, same profile, same material, same everything. And then there's some where you can go depending on the time of year up to like a, on this shank I'm going to tie tonight up to like a four or four and a quarter. Um, so we'll tie a little bit bigger of, of one again. If you don't have the exact size shank, just set it a little bit further back in the vise and you're going to save an extra five mils or whatever. So um, 
oops, anyways, this one's a 53. So I'm gonna put that, set that in the vise. And this I would say is generally gonna be like an emerald shiner or a classic shiner daisy type minnow imitation. Um, so again, just same as last time, shank in, lay down a thread base. I'll come up and there's a big taper in the nose on this. Uh, Kevin, it's really weird. Sometimes you'll see like his lead eyes will be set right at the midway point of these giant shanks and it's just a long tapered nose. Um, I will generally put them, set the eyes sort of in the top third, especially on one that's this big. So I'll, I'll go back, you know, a third to just over a third of the way back again. Just a few loose wraps, spin that over, figure eight that, and then just do a quick double check to make sure it's sitting level flush. And this is a larger size bead chain. I've just taken two of them, more of a narrower minnow profile on this. Okay, so that's secured. I'll go back to the back. And then I'll come up roughly the midpoint. I'll take another hook on a loop with the braid and I'll come back again, probably the same distance away from the last fly. I don't want the hook or the hook to be too far back from the shank because the shank, there's actually quite a bit of fly on the shank in this one. So I don't, I don't really need to set that hook back too far. Just enough that if you did need to change that hook out, you could. And again, I'm holding that on top, making sure that the braid isn't crossed over. Going right to the back. And then I'm just gonna take the tag ends and fold those over. And trim those off. And then I'll just cinch that down and pull in a little tighter now just to make sure that it's, it's in there and not going anywhere. Come back to the back. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick uh, tail of craft fur. Um, again, brays, um, olives, rust sort of tail. It's not a huge deal, but it, you will see that if you blend it the right way, it really in the water is gonna give you a supernatural look. Um, sometimes I'll blend like an olive and a gray if I don't have an olive gray, which is kind of hard to find. Um, but basically you can, you can play around a lot as long as you're kind of maybe sticking more to making sure you got some white flash in there. Cinnamon ice dub on the head seems to be the, the absolute go-to. Uh, that color in ice dub is incredible. Um, so a lot of maybe making sure you have some blues and whites in the flash. Um, so we'll, we'll just keep going on that. I'm going to take the gray and craft fur is pretty easy to work with. You're just going to take a clump off the patch, trim that up. So I've got just, just enough for the tail there. You can, it's just like deer. You can take the, you can comb the under fur out of it. Um, trim that off and I will just I will pull this just to just to shorten it up uh, once I'm done so don't worry about the length there that would be a six inch fly and we're going to try and keep it around three and a half so I'm just going to hold that over the back the tag ends and lash that down a lot of times Kevin will just leave that um, can't bear to leave that so I'm going to trim that off and just cinch that down and then basically I want this tail just to overhang the back of the hook so that's kind of set the, the the size so I'm looking at this and I'm always kind of measuring I don't want this thing too big so I'm three and a quarter so if you think about a decently sized swung fly Chris three inches isn't out of the game right and that's pretty natural bait fish size to me so I'm just going to pull that basically pinch it and pull that off give it a bit of a taper and uh, 
there's the tail. A big, another big key material that isn't like a readily available thing um, that I'm putting on a lot of the back end of my flies is uh, Easter Bunny Basket Mylar. Um, it's really thick stuff. It is very stiff and it holds and as the light hits it, I think it gives this reflective characteristic that's just nuts and i'm actually putting this stuff on a lot of my streamers like behind the, the the head just to give that kind of lateral flash um you can find this stuff i have an endless bag of it that i that i found um substitutes would be like a saltwater lateral scale or a flat or a hedron product uh just something that's got some good thickness to it like um uh because it's going to be very rigid and stay there so this is just over an eighth inch thick, uh, pretty stiff stuff. And I'm just gonna cut, uh, just taper on that end. And I will tie this in on each side. And I'll put that in just a quarter inch shy of the, the tail of the craft. For it. I'm gonna make sure that that's sitting on the side. And then I'll just take the other the cut end, put another taper on it and tied in on the side away from me. And cinch that down. So I'm not sure if you can kind of see that as the light hits it, but it's, it's pretty cool. Um, I think it's maybe one of, one of the things that fish are keying into on this fly is having that that butt section just with that added flash as it swings through. Um, so quick dubbing loop uh, to build up the body. Again, you can be sparse on this. It doesn't need to be super thick. And if you got to put another loop in it or, you know, feel free if you just want to dub it right on the, right on, you can. Um, here I'm going to use, you can use a yellow waist dub, um, this body just to give it a little, little less Flash. I've got an Arizona dubbing. Um, you could use a semi seal or, or anything like that, like a leech type um, thing. So I, this one's a sparkle nymph dubbing. And I've just made a dubbing loop and I'm just going to kind of stretch this out. Again, the body, I think, is where you're going to generate some movement. So it doesn't need to be super consistent. So as I put it in this loop, I'm not being too concerned that it's gonna be a super uniform body and taper. Um, and if I run out, because this is quite a long shank, you can do another loop or you can just dub in some extra at the back end. So I've got almost just lost that, but almost caught it. That was a pretty good save. Okay, so I've got that loop. I'm just gonna spin that. Um, lock all that in and you can see it, that's pretty rough. Like that is not a very perfect looking dubbing loop by any means, but that's kind of what I'm going for on this. Imitating crudeness. Um, so I've got that. I'm just gonna wrap this up. I'm not going to really bulk it up it's going to be pretty sparse like even if I got some of the darker thread underneath I, I don't care so I'm just trying to keep it relatively consistent in the wraps and I'll use all that up tie that loop off Any questions on dubbing loops or anything like that? Nothing. Okay. Not them seeing. Got a bunch of pros. Perfect. I will just throw another really quick loop in there. I'm just going to bring this up pretty close to the where the eyes are because there is a lot of head left on this thing. So I, I don't need to set the body further back.
So again, I'll just throw another, another little bit in, in another loop. At this point, if you wanted just to dub some more in, you could. But the more you do loops, the more it's almost easier than, than just a straight dubbing rope. So again, I'm just bringing that up, continuing. I'm about, you know, a bead chain width and a half away. That's about it. Some of that will come out and that's fine, but it's body is built. Okay, so now we're gonna, again, add a wing of flash. Uh, in this case, um, I'm gonna use, I find again, I've said, I think I said uh, white. So any kind of white flash, this is a flat and fine uh, uh, RD or just that H2O product. Um, they're not carrying it anymore. This is just an off white. I found really great success with this really limp uh, white flash. You could easily get away with a white glow flash to boo. I just find there's something about the white. So I'm gonna start with, and I'm gonna add some copper and some gray ghost or some gray uh, crystal flash. So you can layer this however you want. This is kind of similar to like a, a Senyo, like the way he layers his wings with flash on artificial intelligence. You can blend, you can blend this stuff any way you want. If it looks good to you and you feel like it's fishy, then that's a good thing. So I'm going to take um, some of the, the gray uh, crystal flash and I'm going to put that down and I'm just gonna bring it, I'm gonna go a little bit longer each time I go with the flash. So this is just shy of the tail, the end of the tail. And I think building a taper and not just ending everything in the same spot does actually improve the swim, even with flash. So I folded that over itself and I'm just gonna just cut that bit of a taper shorter. Okay, so that's your base flash wing on top. And then I'm gonna add some copper, just straight copper, solid copper flashaboo. Um, I really generally am putting copper on most flies and streamers that I'm tying. Um, <clears throat> so again, as much as you want there, take eight to 10 strands, put that off. And again, I'll just tie this on top. You can trim it later, however you want, and I'll pull that back. So now I've got some, some gray crystal flash, which has really neat characteristics in the water. I've got some copper, and then I'm gonna take this white uh, or shrimp colored flat and fine, but again, white, glow flash of boo is going to give you that sort of purpose. Um, you could put in some ice wing or some blue angel hair, or some ripple ice fiber in there to kind of give it some rigidity. Um, sky's the limit on it. Grays, whites, blues, and coppers are generally where I'm headed to with this though. So I got the white, again, same thing. It's building up that overwing. You can kind of press that down with your thumb before you really tighten up and it'll spread it just a, a nice little bit around the shank of the, or the shank. And I'm just making sure that as I go that the ends aren't all ending at the same place. So that's basically the wing, or that is the wing. Um, then I'm going to take a mallard flank feather if you have the good fortune um, in this particular fly, I've got some really nice long ones, long stems. Uh, you, I'm actually gonna try and collar this or palmer it up through the head. Um, if you don't have some really gray mallard or if you're using a different color like a, like a wood duck or whatever, wood duck gold is another great color to put on this stuff. Um, you could do a collar here and then dub your head up and do another collar. 
it's going to give you kind of the same look. Uh, but we will attempt to palmer this one through. So I'm going to prep this feather. I, I don't, you could easily keep both, both sides of the feather on. Um, I'm going to go with just a half. I find that it's easier to wrap. It lays back a little nicer. And um, <clears throat> I find that I get enough out of it. So I'm going to just take and start to lightly and gently preen this down. First of all, I'll clear out the stuff that I know I'm not going to use up the bottom. And then I'm going to take this feather and I'm going to gently sort of pull it down and back and right as much to the tip as I can. And then I'm just going to strip the one side off and the side that I'm taking off is the side that I'm gonna be winding onto the shank. So I've now got this curved, the tips are forward, and I've got the side taken off so that as I lay it in and wrap it, the bare side is gonna be going against the materials. So gently preen that back. I'm gonna lay that in on top, the bend down, and secure it and you could hit this with a little bit of glue if you're concerned it's going to come out or you could put some wax down just to secure it and that's going to be the palmer through so now i'm just going to come up in front of the bead chain and i'm just going to start to build a bit of a tapered head just so that when i'm uh, dubbing the dubbing the head it's going to naturally just create a bit of a taper So again, just building up some bulk there in front of the eyes and tapering that down, okay? And then I'm gonna take uh, an essential cinnamon ice dub. Sorry, I've got some kind of dub going up my nose here. <laughs> um, and I'm not, I'm not gonna put this in a loop. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna dub this on and build up the head. You can be pretty generous with this. You don't wanna dub it too, or too tightly um, because you do want the, the palmered mallard to kind of sink down into it. So I just hit that with a little bit of wax. It's not needed if you're good at laying this down. And I'm just uh, gonna dub this very loosely as I go. I stub super, it's one of the easiest dubbings to dub right on the thread, okay. And you can see that's pretty rough, pretty loose. Um, and I'm just gonna start to lay that down. So I'm giving it a few turns behind, then I'm gonna come in front, I'm gonna come behind and until I'm done. Okay, and then I'm gonna check underneath just to see that I do have some, some dubbing there. If I want, I'm, I'm gonna add a little bit more, but I do wanna make sure that I'm gonna have enough mallard to get to the front of this thing. Um, and I'm just going to come back one more time and then come up through the bottom and you can see I'm starting to build, I'm not sure if you can see that Chris, but we are starting to get a taper going on this. Um, so I'm just going to give a few more turns up front and then I'm going to leave it alone. There's still quite a bit of nose left on that, but I'm going to now palmer the mallard through. So I'm going to brush that. Out. I'm going to pick that out a little bit just so that the feather is going to stay seated in there. And then I'm going to grab my hackle pliers and I'm going to palmer this forward. So I'm going to start with one turn. So I, you can see I've got my half. Everything's going to full, just collar back nicely. I'm going to come underneath. Okay. And then I'm going to come over top. And I'm coming forward, I'm continuing forward as I go until I've come right up to the bare, bare hook. And I'm out of feather. And I'll tie that feather off. So again, you've got on a good mallard feather on this head, you've got starting your turn underneath, and then you're gonna bring that second wrap over the front and then turn till you're done. And it's kind of neat that way if you can pull it off because you don't have to, it, it's sort of nice the way it palmers up through that head. It gives it more of a lifelike kind of look. Um, 
And once you've secured that, you can actually, it's pretty durable. You can brush that out just to spread out the mallard even a little bit more. So they're not, a lot of times they will marry together and it's, and they will clump up. So now you can see the, the head is basically done. And we're gonna add one more hit of the white flash just to finish the fly. Uh, I'm gonna take, you know, about the same amount, 10, 10 to 12 strands. And we'll tie that in on top. And then you could just fold that underneath and bring all that up together and just check out where your ends are if you've got any sort of you can taper that, stagger it. And then just to clean it up a little bit. You could be done there, but I will take a small, just the same, same as what we did on the inside bender. Just take a small clump just to kind of, again, because it's me, just finish that fly off. So again, just a center tight clump, two turns, fold it back, and then you can build up a tapered head. Again, if you've got any, any loose ends, you can just trim those off. <clears throat> and that is that. Um, again, the color combinations when you're blending flash are basically endless, but I do find again on this, whites, blues, cinnamon, lavenders, grays, this yellow is a good one. Uh, but, you know, pretty simple, not a lot of difficult techniques. It's kind of like the only real tricky thing in here is making sure you've got a mallard flank that'll palmer up through that head. But again, if you can't, just do a collar, do your head, do another collar. Very cool. Yeah, very different profile for sure. Yeah. And it, it does, with, the, with that wing, you'd be surprised at how much it does stand out and actually help to create that taper. But the other thing you'll be really surprised on if you can get your hands on that mylar flash or use a stiff saltwater uh, lateral scale, it does it does really provide a hit at the back that's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, well, you can definitely see it on camera for sure. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, it's really not that pretty. Like it really isn't that pretty, but it uh, it does work. Um, so huge fan of that one. And do you find, do you like those two different flies in any kind of like different types of waters or? You just kind of switch back and forth flavor of the day. I don't know. I, I mean, it for me, I'm not I'm not on the water every day, um, and I find that I'm more prone to um, fishing something that I've had success with before. Like I'm not out covering 100 kilometers a river, you know, in 10 days, you know, and. Um, so I don't have that kind of level of experience. So I'm relying more on stuff that works, stuff that is very imitative of things that I've seen in the river. Um, and I'm kind of going on that. I, I can't pretend to have it dialed in to the point where I'm going to change to a darker one if I go into a two foot deeper hole with a sweeper. I mean, for me, that's not, <laughs> I'm, not I'm not there. Um, and, but certainly, changing depths, I think on the same fly, like if you're swinging that thing and it feels good, like it's just, it, it, it feels like it's swinging well, feels like the right time of place. And you're just not, not ticking bottom and not hitting anything. Make sure you have one with some lead on the bottom, two, two strips of lead on the bottom of that could put you down eight inches on the same swing. Um, and that might give you that, Oh, I just ticked bottom. Ooh, I'm right where I want to be. Um, so that's kind of what I would play with more is, is stick with patterns that have been successful, especially if you're kind of out once or twice a week or even once every other week. Um, you don't have time to mess around, right? Like you want to just get it done. So yeah, that's fair. Hmm. I definitely can relate to that. <laughs> for sure. For sure. And especially if you're traveling, you know, two and a half hours from the city or whatever to get up, get up to the river. Um, stick with stick with what has worked for you but learn about it too because 
reading reading that book or reading about more bait fish and and behavior can pay off a lot in the way you fish. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people could learn from a lot of streamer anglers when it comes to steelheading around here. Just the waters that they've practiced on are much more similar than a lot of what you read from, you know, the, like a lot of steelhead article, articles from out west and stuff, right? Like. Mm -hmm. you know, a yeah. resident brand trout versus a steelhead might behave a little different but it's the same waters like you say so yeah something to gather from that for sure and for all of us that aren't full-time guides and, and have been learning for 20 years on your home water i mean i know a lot about the grand um but i'm i'm still I'm not on it every day um so using the knowledge that people are willing to share, like someone like Kevin that spent a lot of time studying it, you know, you can, that will pay off for you, right? And um, especially with steelheading, it's finding those patterns that you're always going to go to, I think is uh, a lot more beneficial than um, trying to change up all the time. Stick with what you know, if it's fishing well, generally, if you're in the zone, you're going to be successful.